Nice. Passionate obedience. Passionate obedience is what I want to talk about, is what we're going to talk about today. And, uh, and that looks different um, for, for all of us. We all have different areas in our walk with the Lord that, that uh, we are growing, that we are being strengthened in, that we are being tested in, and that we are being stretched in. And uh, <laughs> even this, this right here, this right here is an example of passionate obedience. To stand here and to talk, um, the Lord, over time, He keeps sharing things with me and He asks me to share them and I keep getting it wrong. I keep some things I get right, some things I get wrong. He asks me to share things and a lot of times I feel His heart in the matter and I don't always deliver them properly. Like, you know, uh, it could be the right word, but if it's delivered with the wrong heart, it isn't usually received. You understand? And, uh, and so in, in, in some of these failures or some of these hiccups or some of these stumblings, it causes me to shrink back. You know what I mean? Not out of fear, but out of, uh, out of I don't want to disappoint my father. You, you understand? Um, so he gives things uh, a lot of times, at least for me to share, that are really pressing the envelope against a lot of what we've learned our whole lives. And, and, with that, he, he, he keeps giving me a little bit of a time, a little bit at a time, which is really great. Um, and it's also scary, but I believe he has got me on a journey right now at this point of really figuring out and digging into the Word more than I ever have my whole entire life. I am in so many different versions of passages, so many, I mean, everything from, I mean, from, from, from the Old Testament to the New Testament to researching the, the sages and the rabbis at that time and what they thought the interpretation of the Bible was, and then trying to deliver those things sometimes are pretty difficult, pretty difficult. And so I really feel like um, the Lord has me in this avenue of really dividing His Word, and, and it isn't always lining up with what I've been taught in church. And so this is where I begin to stumble. And uh, even just recently, the Lord, I feel like he had shared with me, he said, this is no different than the things that Jesus went through. This is no different than the things the apostles went through. This is no different than what Paul went through. And these guys were always uh, coming against individuals who were trying to follow traditions of man as opposed to the words of God. And the more... Uh, the Bible says, you know, to increase with knowledge is to increase sorrow. And the more I learn, the more sorrowful I get, unfortunately. I wish that it didn't say that, but <laughs> I wish that it said the more you, with knowledge came amazingness, but that just isn't really the case. And so uh, we try to deliver a, just a couple of things, just a couple of morsels of what the Lord has been sharing with me. And I want you to take some of these things that you hear today, take them before the Lord. Don't take my word for it. I mean, he has the ultimate authority. I'm going to try to share with you the things that he shared with me, and you should take the things that I share with you and take them back to him and go, is this cat serious right now? Is this really what you're doing right now in this day and this age? So don't take my word for it. Take the words that you hear and take them to the Lord and ask him what he thinks. So with that being said, I want you guys to just take a moment, and I want you to look back at your very own walk with the Lord. Think about it, okay? Some of us have uh, been saved for a week or two. Some of us have been saved for 70, 80 years. But I want you to try to go back and think, how did you come to salvation? How did you come to salvation? And then even where you are now, okay? Um, I don't know about y'all, but for me, how it went was uh, I was in a lot of struggle, I was in a lot of turmoil. I was in a lot of torment, for lack of better terms. And, uh, and I came to a place of the end of myself, the end of trying to do what I thought was right, the end of trying to do it my way, um, just the end of myself. And I came to a place of uh, total surrender. And uh, that was foreign to me because to ren- surrender, the word surrender or submit to a young man, that just doesn't go good. You know what I mean? That shows weakness, or so I thought. 
I had no idea that in the surrender was going to be the greatest freedom in my life that I've ever experienced. So first was struggle or torment, and then I encountered Jesus, which happened to be salvation. And then after salvation, I went through what I dub or what I call the honeymoon phase, where everything is amazing. You're learning all this new information about God. You're learning everything is so fresh and so excited. And, uh, and I might have did a little bit of damage in that time because I was so excited to share the Lord with my loved ones. I started putting them in all kinds of bondage with all the do's and the don'ts. And, and you can't do that. And you can't have a girlfriend unless you're married. And you better not do this. And, and uh, I lost a few friends along the way in my zeal and my zealousness. Well, then after this honeymoon phase, you know, I just, I don't want to get off the honeymoon phase. It's so amazing. It's like the Lord hunted me down. The Lord chased me down. He pursued me and he just revealed himself to me in such a way. And I like to think that he did that with y'all that have a relationship with him. It was so amazing that first sometimes few months, sometimes few years. Um, But after that, a little separation began to happen. You know, uh, the Lord's voice wasn't so loud and his miracles weren't so in my face. A little bit of time started to come between them. And, um, you know, it caused me to kind of question things like, where did you go, Lord? Like, you used to be so in my face and now you're not there so much. And to, uh, to, you know, I'm asking where he's at and what he's doing. And then he brings me to this restoration or maybe this revival stage where like he kind of restores me back to this awesome relationship, almost like bits and pieces of the honeymoon stage again. He's like, he's like drawing me, you know, to press into him. And then, uh, and then ultimately what happens is he kind of slowly fades off into the distance and it leaves me going, Lord, where did you go? And so we end up in this, I end up in this never-ending cycle of hide and seek. You know what I'm saying? Like, the Lord is there, and it's great, and then he's gone, and it's not. And then I find him again over here, and it's amazing, and then he disappears, and I'm stressed out and freaking out. Like, where did you go? Where did you go? And so uh, the the Lord has kind of showed me what, what this is, is this is mountaintops, and this is valleys. And, uh, you know, when I first began walking with the Lord, I would go up to the mountaintop, and the mountaintop was big and long. The mountaintop was amazing. (laughs) We was above the storms, you know what I'm saying, up on top of the mountain. And then, uh, you know, as I continued to develop my relationship with the Lord, I started to recognize that the mountaintops weren't so long at the top anymore, but they were more like up and down. So it was like this real quick blast of amazingness, and then I started coming right back down. And it's then like, down at the bottom is the desert. We got the top of the mountain, and then we have the desert down here, or the valley. Started to recognize that the, the desert and the valley was getting longer and bigger. And uh, I didn't care for that much. <laughs> I didn't care for that at all. And so uh, I want to ask you guys, you know, if you was to break it down between two seasons of mountaintops and valleys, or mountaintops and deserts, where do you experience the greatest spiritual growth? I'll let you think about it. Okay. Now, for me personally, I used to think that the mountaintop was where the growth is. That's not it. I've learned that over time, it's in the valleys, in the desert, is where the growth occurs. Um, you know, it's in the <laughs> it's in the desert where I'm frantically pursuing him, and I mean frantically pursuing him. Like, I'm looking under everything. I'm, I'm going all over the place, trying to get to that place that I once was, which is the mountaintop. And it's, uh, I'm trying to find a place where I can receive some peace or some shelter during a storm. And it's, I can sit here right now and say it's amazing, but as I'm going through it, it is not amazing. It is not fun. Um, it makes me question my salvation. It makes me question the love of the Father. Are you there? Do you even care? I mean, can't you see I'm down here floundering? And uh, <laughs> where did you go? And, and I like to think about this as, as even as children growing up. Um, newborn babies, they're beautiful. 
they're amazing, you know. And then they get like two or three. They're not so beautiful. They're not so amazing. <laughs> they're still awesome. They're still awesome. I still love them to pieces, but they bring this whole other thing of challenges. They start messing things up. And that's what my walk with the Lord is like. And uh, I would have to only assume that maybe that's kind of what your walk with the Lord might be like. And then we become, you know, adolescents, you know. Um, I would say 10 and under, and that's where it kind of even gets a little more messy because, you know, they want to try, but they make some pretty good messes. <laughs> and then we get this teenager age where uh, we know more than, my teenager knows more than me, I can promise you that. If I knew half of what my teenager knows, I would be intelligent. And uh, it might be like that with the Lord. You know what I'm saying? The Lord's like, hey, I got A, B, C, D in store for you. And I'm like, nah, let me tell you how I'm going to do it. And he goes, okay, go ahead and do that. Let me know how it works out for you. And I find myself in a valley again. <laughs> and then that, uh, you know, that amazing, I could say that goes on probably from teenage, I would say even up to the th maybe 30 and then somewhere about 30 to 40, a light bulb goes off. You know what? My mom and dad are a little smarter than I gave them credit for. And I like to think that that's where we can get in our walk with the Lord. As we get to a place of, you know what? Maybe the Lord's ways are a little better than what I was given credit for. And uh, <clears throat> so we start to press in to the Lord, to our Father. And... Uh, I can tell you this, whether I'm on the mountaintop or in the valley, I've discovered that growth only occurs through obedience. It only grows through obedience. I can try to do it my way as much as I want to. I can struggle, I can kick, I can fight, I can toil to a place of submission and obedience in which I'll grow, or I can listen to my Father and be obedient and grow right out of the gate. Both paths lead to growth, but one is not fun, and one is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> I'm learning to obey my Father, and it's hard. I mean, maybe for you guys it's easy. For me it is not. Because I still find myself wanting to do things my way. So uh, Romans chapter 6, verses 16 through 23. I will read them. I'll read them out of the New Living Translation. It says, Don't you realize that whatever you choose to obey becomes your master? You can choose sin which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God and receive his approval. Thank God. Once we were slaves to sin, but now we have obeyed with all my heart the new teaching God has given. Now you are free from sin of your old master, and you have become slaves to your new master, righteousness. I speak this way using the illustration of slaves and masters because it's easy to understand. Before you let yourselves before you let yourselves be slaves of impurity and lawlessness, now you must choose to be slaves of righteousness so that you will become holy. In those days, when you were slaves of sin, you weren't, consumed, you weren't concerned with doing what was right. And what was the result? It was not good. Since now you are ashamed of the things that you used to do, things that end in eternal doom, but now you are free from the power of sin and become slaves of God. Now you do those things which lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And now we go back up here to this, this letterhead, passionate obedience. The passion to obey God usually doesn't come naturally. It just doesn't. Again, I, I think about our children and... Uh, you know, when they're little kids, they listen to us a little bit, but not maybe fully. <laughs> they listen to a version of what we said, but they don't really fully listen to what we say. And I can use that analogy for children 
and then also take me as the children of the Most High. I mean, I'm 40 years old, and 40 years old in the scope of eternity is pretty childish. <laughs> so, uh, salvation, salvation, it may spark love and a desire to please Him. However, passion to obey Him happens over time. You guys follow that? In my salvation, I was very passionate to do whatever he wanted to do. But then the passion slowly started to fade away. And now the rekindling of this passion, it happens over time. And it happens through three things. I'm going to go over them. The, the first one is spiritual knowledge. The second is faith. And the third is devotion. So, <clears throat> spiritual knowledge. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. It says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. I wish that's all that it said. But that's a two-part scripture. I wanted to just pick and choose. As a, as a youngster in Christ, a lot of us like to pick and choose what scriptures best suit us, what scriptures are for us, to mold God into almost a genie in a bottle to get what I want, when I want, how I want. But the other part of that scripture, it says, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest unto me, seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. <laughs> That's pretty harsh, isn't it? Is that pretty harsh? Wait a minute. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And God says, because I rejected him, he rejects me. And I'm like, well, I didn't reject you. Lord, I did not reject you. And he goes, well, you know, you've forgotten my law. You've forgotten my statutes. You've forgotten the things that I've told you to do. And because you've forgotten the things I told you to do, I'll forget you. Whoa, whoa, why the harshness? We're not in the honeymoon stage no more. You know what I'm saying? There was an awful lot of grace, um, you know. And the grace is still there, don't get me wrong. God loves us. But he starts to become a little more forthright, <laughs> Uh, with the way that he speaks to me. So number one is spiritual knowledge. You know, my people are destroyed for their lack of knowledge. First comes salvation, and then we begin to learn about God. It's no different than, than the Israelites through the Exodus. <laughs> they, were, they, were, they were freed from bondage, and then they went to Mount Sinai to receive instruction. You understand that? You see the pattern? Listen, if we pay attention to Israel, they are the pattern for everything that we are doing, everything that we're going to do. <laughs> they are the ultimate pattern. Pay attention to the nation of Israel, and you can see where the Lord is and how they was in bondage to Egypt, and then the Lord set them free, and then they went to Mount Sinai to get what we call the law. And really, it really wasn't so much law. It was really instructions. <laughs> and even now, the Lord is giving me a, a revelation that I'm in the midst of, is, and it's, it's seeing the law from two different points of view. We have to be able to see the law pre-salvation and then post-salvation. What does that look like? <laughs> well, the purpose of the law pre-salvation was to show me that I'm a sinner, to show me that I cannot keep the commandments of God, to show me that I need a Savior, You understand? Pre-salvation law, post-salvation law. After you received salvation, now the law is the way to righteousness. Think about that. Jesus is my righteousness. His law is written on my heart. <laughs> and so I walk out these things. I get the option to become his righteousness. Am I wrong? I'm I'm just, just provoking thought. So you have the law, the law, <laughs> pre-salvation condemns me, post-salvation is a way of life. Am I? Okay. Here's another thing that the Lord is kind of revealing to me. Um, I'm going to ask you guys a couple of questions, and you don't have to answer them. Answer them within yourselves. How do you feel about the Ten Commandments. Are they good or are they bad? Just put it within yourself. You don't got to answer me. 
how do you feel about the Ten Commandments? Okay? Number two, are the Ten Commandments applicable to the church today? You don't have to answer it. Just think about it. Do the Ten Commandments apply to the church today? Just think about it. <laughs> Just think about it. This is what the Lord has shown me about the Ten Commandments, okay? The Ten Commandments. The first five commandments are how to love God. The second five commandments are how to love my neighbor. Isn't that wild? Because what did Jesus say when they asked him, what are the greatest commandments? And he said, well, you know, love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength is one. And the second is equally important, love your neighbor as yourself. Is that not what he said? He just took the law and he summed it up into two, which is the Ten Commandments. Love God, love your neighbor. Pretty amazing, huh? <laughs> Pretty amazing. I just want you to keep that and kind of put it in your pocket. Put the Ten Commandments thing in your pocket. So, <laughs> passion to obey him happens over time, and it's built slowly through spiritual knowledge, faith, and devotion. So we just briefly talked about spiritual knowledge. Now we're going to move on to faith, okay? Faith. What is faith? Well, Hebrews 11.1, 1, it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of of the things unseen, okay? So in this rekindling of our passion to get back to our honeymoon phase, <laughs> I love the honeymoon phase. I'm hoping that maybe heaven might kind of be like that just a little, that it's always all amazing, but you never know. So uh, faith, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen, you know? First, I have no knowledge, and I'm going to perish, you know, the Israelites were perishing. They weren't even nothing before they received the law. <laughs> and then they got some information. They received some knowledge and began to operate in faith. They started to hope for things. After my salvation, before my salvation, I was pretty uh, negative. <laughs> nothing was good. Nobody was good. The world is bad. Everybody's bad. I hate you. You hate me. <laughs> that was just how I was. And then salvation happened, and hope started to happen. I learned a little bit about Jesus. I learned a little bit about God. Began to understand that when things aren't going my way, that's not God being mad at me. That maybe that was the enemy or the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And so I began to have hope for things. I began to hope for a good marriage. Hope for amazing children. Hope for a good job, hope for friendships, legitimate friendships, not friendships that take advantage of you any way they can. You know, the worldly friendships, godly friendships. <laughs> ah, so after faith begins to happen, devotion comes. Start to have these little pieces of breakthrough and faith, and then devotion. I begin devoting myself to God to his ways, to his plans, to his purposes. Now, 1 Samuel 12, 24, it says, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. Part one. Part two is, For consider how great things he has done for me. Part two. I'll read it to you all at once. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all of your heart. For consider how great things he has done for you. Okay? The first one addresses devotion to him. Fear him and serve him in truth with all of my heart. The second one is how I got to that point. Consider how great things he has done for me. It was only through salvation that I was even able to begin to be devoted to him. <laughs> Bring that back over here to Exodus. <laughs> they were not a nation. They were just a people. It was just Israel, the Hebrews. It was just the Hebrews. <laughs> and then he redeemed them. He saved them from bondage. And then he showed them his ways. He said, these are my ways. These are my ways. Will you do them? And they said, absolutely, we will do them. 
But it was only when they got salvation could they begin to be devoted to him. Okay? Another passage uh, for devotion is 2 Corinthians 5.15. It says, He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live to please themselves. Instead, they will live to please Christ, who died and was raised for them. Again, how to rekindle this passionate obedience that uh, I once had when I was a newly saved baby Christian and then kind of got away from that is spiritual knowledge, faith, and devotion. (laughs) Devotion, devotion to God. Devotion to God. So now we're going to go through these just a little bit, not too crazy. Now, obedience. What is obedience, okay? Obedience is obeying, doing what I'm told. Obedience usually begins with a fear of the consequences of disobeying. (laughs) When my kids didn't do what they were supposed to do, you see this thing right here? This is a leather belt. My oldest boy, he would get it. This was (laughs) pre-Jesus. My middle boy and my daughter, well, my middle boy got it too, but my daughter doesn't hardly ever, I don't think she even has ever, my daughter's never seen the, uh, <laughs> the belt portion of consequences for disobeying. She got, that was post-Jesus. <laughs> uh, so uh, an example, you know, when we're baby Christians, the whole purpose for our obedience is fear of going to hell or fear of the lake of fire. You know, I think I've said it before was uh, I didn't necessarily come into Christianity about, I wasn't trying to have a relationship with God. I just didn't, I just wanted to go to heaven. I mean, who doesn't want to go to heaven? What is heaven? I had no idea what heaven is. It's got to be better than hell though. So that's how my salvation occurred. And then uh, I began obeying out of this fear, okay? However, as I matured in Christ and I be- begin to build a scriptural foundation or gain spiritual knowledge. You guys connecting that? That fear of going to hell began to transform into believing his promises, or faith, okay? Continuing to trust in Yeshua, recognizing God's sovereignty and submitting to his wisdom. Submitting to his wisdom. Hmm. And over time, following the Lord became less about consequences for disobeying and more about blessings for obeying. Isn't that amazing? But it doesn't stop there. See, that's where so many of us get hung up. It's all about me. Bless me. I want to be blessed. Give me, give me, give me. Okay? One is, (laughs) over time, following the Lord becomes less about consequences for disobeying. That's one. We don't want no consequences. But more about blessings for obeying. But then ultimately, when you become into the maturity of your walk with Christ, you begin obeying him as a way of showing him you love him. Now, let's go back to that Ten Commandments for a minute, okay? The first five, he tells you how to love him. The second five, he tells you how to love your neighbor. They're two different things. I need you guys to catch this. You don't show God you love him the way that you show him to your friends. You show God the way you love him, the way he tells you he wants to be loved. We so many times get him confused, okay? I'm not saying, yeah, do good for your neighbor. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm saying how we love our neighbor is different than how we love God. You guys following me? Let me show you where it says that, okay? 1 John chapter 5. Verse 3. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. It says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Oh, that goes against everything I've ever been taught. I've been told to keep the commandments of God as being underneath of the law. But now I read in his word, that is to keep his commands are not burdensome. And when I actually keep him, when I keep his commands, 
I'm showing that I love him. We're coming back to that passionate obedience again. Whoo! Now, my friend disappeared, Lonnie. He's somewhere. (laughs) But uh, Lonnie and his lovely bride, Yolanda, and my lovely bride, Susie, and myself, we're going to put on a little uh, marriage class. I think, you know, we told you briefly about it. The, The goal is to do just four weeks, but we're... We're holding, if we run into six weeks, that's fine. Um, we're still working out the details of, of child care and whatnot. And that isn't only two people that uh, are recently married or not married that want to be married. But it's also to us that have been married for 20, 30 years. We've been married 20 years, haven't we? 20 years. <laughs> um, it's for those that have been married for a long time as well. Why? Because, because it isn't just about... Lonnie and myself and Yolanda and Susie talking at you guys. It's about um, it's about everybody talking together. You know, some of you cats that have been married for a long time have more experience than those that have not. And even those those of you that have not been married for that long have passion that some that have been married for fifty years maybe don't have as much as they used to have. So this is to go all the way around to help everybody. So in this class, we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to briefly, uh, Susie and I are briefly going to touch on a book by Gary Chapman. It's called The Five Love Languages. Some of you guys have heard it. Some of you guys haven't. Well, in this book of five love languages, this guy uh, recognizes and lays out that there's five love languages. There's primarily five love languages. And those five love languages is one, how we give love, and two, how we receive love. And he really helps to delineate uh, the difference, and when we can locate and understand how we give love and how we receive love, we'll help ourselves. What's even better is when you figure out how your spouse receives love, you can love her the way that she wants to be loved. So, um, I don't remember all of them off the top of my head. Acts of service is one, words of affirmation is one, uh, touch is one. Susie, can you help me with the other ones? Fishing, that's not one. That's not one. Gifts, yeah, gifts of giving is one, giving gifts. So I got to brush up on all of this. But I want to tell you this. Um, I've learned now over time that my wife's primary love language is acts of service. Okay? My primary love language is touch. Now, that doesn't mean crazy touch. Just if my wife lays her hand on my arm, I feel loved, okay? But when I lay my, wife, when I lay my hand on my wife's arm, she's like, get off me. Because that's not how she really receives love. That's how I receive love, but not how she receives love. You follow me? She receives love by me doing the dishes. Now, when I do the dishes, I'm amazing. <laughs> when I do the laundry, I'm a superstar. Let me tell you what, but I don't like doing this stuff. That's not, how I, that's not how I do love. That's how she do love. When I understand how she does love, I can love her better because that's how she receives love. I use that example here for the Lord. God's love language is obedience. <laughs> His love language is obedience. Go back there and check it out again. Read it for yourself. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, King James Version, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Okay, you guys tracking with me? Read it in 20 different versions. I did. And it only reaffirms over and over and over that this is how God receives our love. And think about, I think about uh, Cain and Abel. Think about it. God wanted sacrifices a certain way. They both brought him an offering, but he only received one. You tracking with me? Okay. They both gave him sacrifices, but he only received one. I want you to, I'm going to paraphrase because I don't got it on the top of my head, but there's there's a passage in the New Testament that says, on that day, many will come to him and they will say, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. Lord, we healed the sick in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. Now, I've heard that taught a million times of 
us not having a personal relationship with the Father or with Jesus. I'm now coming to understand that there's a difference there between works motivation and obeying what he said. Because there's we do good works based off what we think, but that isn't what God said. And so again, I'm in this thing of studying and learning and understanding the difference between the teaching of man and the teaching of God, or what we would call what Mark chapter 7 says is traditions of men. And what's so crazy is this is what Jesus spent all of his time fighting, specifically on Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, was what the Pharisees and the Sadducees said as opposed to what God said. Now try to remember, in Matthew chapter 5, the New Testament wasn't wrote yet. (laughs) It wasn't canonized. So Jesus was teaching the people out of the Old Testament. Grace has been from the beginning. Grace didn't just show up on the scene when Jesus showed up. Just thought-provoking. Think about this, guys. Think about this. Okay, It's no different in Paul. Paul was teaching against the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, we love to use the Scripture. We love to use this Scripture. We love to use this Scripture. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Now, there's no standalone Scripture in the entire Bible. I want you guys to understand that. The Lord reveals himself in patterns, okay? So he reveals himself in patterns. He does things over and over and over and over and over and over. And when you find a discrepancy in the Bible, there's one of two things that's happened. It's been mistranslated wrong or our revelation is wrong. I want you to understand that. Because the Word of God is what? Is it is it 2 Timothy 3.16? For the Word of God is... Uh, infallible, used for the edification. You guys follow me? I paraphrase that one also. So Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, it says, so don't, this is Paul here talking, so don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink, or for what not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths, for these rules were only shadows of the real thing of Christ himself. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on self-denial. And don't let anyone say you must worship angels, even though they've had visions about this. These people claim to be so humble, but their sinful minds have made them proud. I just want to pause just a minute. We like to take that verse 16. Don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink and not celebrate in certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. We like to, use, we like to take that and use that for the justification of what we do or don't do. Okay? Don't let no man judge you for what you eat. You guys, you know what I'm saying? We take that out of context because if you roll down here to verse 21 and 22, you, you see what I'm saying? You've got to take it as a, as a whole. Verse 21 and 22, it says, don't handle, don't eat, don't touch. Such rules are mere human teachings. Whose teachings? Human teachings. Such rules are mere human teachings about the things that are gone as soon as we use them. He's tell, Paul's telling you, he's separating the difference between God's teachings and man's teachings. We, I'm telling you guys, we've got to read these scriptures very carefully because we have a tendency, humanity has a tendency to find the loophole that's going to benefit us the greatest. I remember when I started doing tithes. I remember when I started paying tithes, and this is where I went. Well, do I pay off the gross or the net? I was looking how I could pay the cheapest amount, It's just what we do naturally. We're always looking for a way to give the least amount with the biggest benefit. (laughs) I might be wrong, but that's just how I work. I want the biggest bang for the for the less buck. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna get off. I'm gonna get off of that. I wasn't intending to go that route at all. (laughs) I gotta come back come back into center here. Come back into center. (laughs) Come back to center. Okay. God's love language is obedience. Obedience. <sighs> Psalms 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts him. Okay? Once we taste and see his goodness, we learn that obedience and God's best are natural partners. 
Did you catch that? Obedience and God's best are natural partners. Is he a good father? Is he a loving father? Does he want what's best for you? Does he know the end from the beginning? Then if he asks us to do something, it's in our best interest to do that. Okay? Again, 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Again, 10 commandments. Are they applicable for today? Was they for us or not for us? Just, just asking. I mean, I don't know. Every church I've ever been to is like, oh, the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments. I would encourage you all to read the Ten Commandments and ask yourself, do I keep the Ten Commandments? You guys do whatever you want. You don't have to. And we're just going through the Word of God. Okay? Jesus came and created a renewed covenant from Jeremiah 31 that was actually the original covenant out of Exodus. He wrote his law on our hearts. Pretty sure that's in Hebrews chapter 8. If he wrote the law on our hearts, it must still be applicable. Why would he write it on our hearts if it wasn't for us to do? The difference, again, is pre-salvation, post-salvation. Pre-salvation, the law was used to condemn you, convict you, and teach you that you need a Savior. Post-salvation is His ways. It is how you are righteous. It's His righteousness. If not anything else, I hope that all of you dig deep into your Bibles. Because this stuff is pressing me to dig deeper than I ever have. Because ultimately, I want to love my father. I don't want to get to the Bema seat and go, uh, well, I thought I was doing it right. Now, and there, I want you guys to try to hear my heart on this. This isn't about doing the law to receive salvation. Please hear my heart on this. This is about doing what my father asked because I love him. Please see the delineation. Salvation cannot be earned. It is a free gift from God. You follow me? So once we taste and see his goodness, we learn that obedience and God's best are natural partners. They go hand in hand. What does this mean? What does this mean? Okay. It means God derives from, I'm sorry, good. It means good Good derives or comes from following divine commands, okay? That would be the mountaintop. You follow me? While suffering results when we demand our own way. You get what I'm saying? Get what I'm saying? (laughs) That's how the two go hand in hand. Taste and see that the Lord is good. His ways are not our ways. Isn't that Isaiah 55? Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are higher than my ways, and his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. So here's just a red flag. When we think we got it figured out, gut check. When we think we got it all figured out, gut check. Because he said his ways are higher than our ways. Thank God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jehovah. You have sent us the Holy Spirit to teach us your ways. Hmm. Good derives from following divine commands. That's the mountaintop. While suffering results when we demand our own way. This is an irrevocable principle that plays out through the entire Bible as well as our day-to-day life. Okay, the more we observe it, the more we realize the Lord's will is the wisest choice. His will. Some of this stuff is so simple that I can't even fathom how I missed it. (laughs) I'm so repentant. Lord, please forgive me again. Lord, forgive me. I ask that you would forgive me for thinking that you were my genie in a Bible and when I tacked on in Jesus' name, you were going to do it for me. Please, Lord, forgive me. You are my God. I am your servant to represent your kingdom on this earth, to live life the way you asked me to live life. 
Passionate obedience. I'm going to get all this tied together, I promise. (laughs) All the promised blessings in the world cannot make a believer follow God into some of the frightening places that are upon us. Wrap your head around that, okay? All of the promised blessings in the world cannot make a believer follow God in to some of the frightening places that are upon us, okay? This is where our love for the Father comes in. Does love not cast out all fear? Perfect love, perfect love. Not my version of love, perfect love. His love, perfect love, cast out all fear. Our love of the Father will uphold us when we are in some of these frightening places, okay? You guys all know, you guys pay attention to what's going on in the world. You know, we've been hearing it come over and over and over and over from this pulpit about persecution, persecution, okay? You know, where are, where are we, where we are and as believers in this world and this nation? And I'm telling you, a line is being drawn in the sand and we are going to have to make decisions. We are going to have to make decisions. Am I going to stand on the Word of God? Or am I going to stand over here to be socially and politically correct? I have to check my heart on this because I'm a big... But when it's standing right in front of you, what do you do then? I know I'm getting a little bit ahead. Rod touched on this actually last week. He said, you know, we're set free by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The other part of that is they loved their lives not unto death. He's talking about the disciples. He's talking about not just the disciples, but us believers. We are set free from the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Do you understand what that means? Have you ever thought about that really slow? there's a possibility that we may give up our lives for the cause. You understand? That is just a reality check. That is so different from salvation to go to heaven. Like, what did I sign up for? I get tricked into this. Turn to Daniel chapter 3 if you, if you got your Bibles, if you can. If you don't, that's okay. Daniel chapter 3. This chapter, just as an overview, is uh, it's King Nebuchadnezzar had finished up, you know, uh, building his giant statue, and, uh, and he, was, he had made a law, made a decree that everybody's going to bow down to this thing whenever they hear the music play. That was way, way paraphrased. If you got your Bible, please check it out and read it. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar chapter 3, it says, uh, let me see here, we'll we'll pick it up here at uh, chapter 3, verse 3. I'll read out of the New Living Translation. It says, uh, when all these officials had arrived and were standing before the image King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, a herald shouted out, people of all races and nations and languages, Listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and the other instruments, bow to the ground and worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. Did you guys catch that? Did you read all that? Did you hear what I just... Okay, you're, you're following me? Okay. Now, this dude... This Babylonian king made a decree, you're going to bow down to this image, this idol that I have made. Anytime you hear the sound of a horn, and if you don't, I'm going to kill you. How's that sound? Yay. I'm telling you, Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 says, what has been will be again. What has been will be again. Okay. We're just making a circle. Um, whew. 
Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever the race and nation and language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But some of the astrologers went to the king and informed him of the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king. You issued a decree requiring that all people bow down and worship the gold statue, and when they hear the sound of the musical instruments, that decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They have defied your majesty by refusing to serve your gods or to worship the gold statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage, ordered Shadmach, Reshek, and Abednego to be brought out before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue that I have set up? Ask them a question. Have you done this? I might be wrong, but I got a feeling it's not too far off in the distant future that we're going to be asked questions and... Um, the answers that we give are going to determine the, uh, I don't even know, the privileges that we get or don't get. You understand? I might be wrong. I hope that I am. Lord Jesus, please let me be wrong. <laughs> he says, I will give you one more chance. If you bow down and worship the statue that I made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments, all will be well. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. Now, see, here's the thing. These cats understood this 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that you obey his commands. If you roll over to Exodus chapter 20, that's where the issue of the Ten Commandments are. And I'll roll over there just for this one. I mean, you, like I said, you guys can check them all out. Exodus chapter 20, um, verse 4. Do not make idols of any kind, whether in the shape of birds, animals, or fish. You must never worship or bow down to them. Now, these guys didn't make the idol, you hear me? But Nebuchadnezzar did, and he made a decree that said, you will bow down to it, okay? And if you don't, you'll kill them. These guys loved the Lord so much that obeying his command was how they re revealed their love to him. It wasn't that they were... Uh, it wasn't that they wanted to disobey the king. In fact, I'm pretty sure that these three dudes had a little bit of favor with the king. The king liked these three dudes. He didn't want to kill them. You get what I'm saying? All right, you must never worship or bow down. Hold on, let me start over. Do not make idols of any kind, whether in the shape of birds or animals or fish. You must never worship or bow down to them, for I am the Lord your God. I'm a jealous God who will not share your affection with any other God. I do not leave unpunished the sins of those who hate me, but I punish the children for the sins of their parents to the third and the fourth generations. But I lavish my love on those who love me and obey my commands, even for a thousand generations. That's a pretty long, you know, commandment, but it's full of amazingness. He lavishes his love on those that obey his commandments. Now, he loves us if we don't obey his commandments. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> I don't know why I keep looking at you, Jesse. <laughs> I love you to pieces. <laughs> uh, but so it was in these guys' love of the Father is why they couldn't bring themselves to bow down to this other idol. It was, no, it was intended for no disrespect to the king. You know what I mean? It was, an inspect, it was intended to love their God. You, you follow me there? <laughs> yeah. It says, yeah, that's what I wrote down. Let me see here. So where, where I'm going with this, let me see here. At the end of... Da, 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 da. Verse 15 again, I will give you one more chance. If you bow down and worship the statue I have made, when you hear the sound of the musical instruments, all will be well. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. What God will be able to rescue you from my power then? I would think them cats are scared. I would have been scared. So we have this thing, okay? Fear or love God. What's going to win? 
does perfect fear, or I'm sorry, does perfect love cast out all fear? Is, is that kind of maybe what that passage means in Revelation? For we're set free by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and we loved our lives not even unto death. See, the disciples had this revelation. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, they had this revelation. We need to get this revelation. <laughs> to be absent from the body is to be present before the Lord. We need to get ourselves mentally prepared. Okay, I hope that God we're raptured out of here before any of this nonsense happens. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. But what if we ain't? Just a thought. What if we ain't? What if, what if we have to make it a choice? What if we have to make a choice for our faith? You know what I mean? What if we, I don't know. I'd rather, I'd rather hope for the rapture. You know what I'm saying? Or I'd rather, let me see how to say this. I would rather prepare myself than if the rapture doesn't happen. I'm a little bit prepared than if I hope for the rapture and the rapture doesn't happen when I want it to. Now I'm left going, oh my goodness, what? What? Lord, I thought you loved me. You ain't going to make me go, <laughs> what? We need to get ourselves prepared mentally for any and all types of persecution. We have to think about this stuff, guys. I mean, if you don't, fine, don't. I'm not saying that you have to. Don't. <laughs> but I think it, it, does us, it does us some really good to try to consider all different aspects of all different possible scenarios. You know what I mean? It, it just, it'll prepare you. It, it'll prepare me. So I, I guess that's what I'm going to do. Is, uh, we're going to have to make, we're going to have to make a choice. Are we going to stand on God's principles? Or again, are we going to conform to the world? Are we going to conform you know what I'm saying? Am I going to say that's a boy or a girl? Or am I going to say you can say whatever you want to be because the government said I have to say that? That's where we're at. That's where we're at. That's... We need the disciples of the revelation, again, of what Rod said, Revelations 12, 11. They overcome him, Satan. They, we overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. That loving God is going to give us the strength to walk through anything that might be scary, catastrophic. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8, where it, it basically says to be absent from the body is to be present before the Lord. That these homes are not our home. This, this dirt suit that I'm in is again going to go to dirt and my spirit is going to go to be with the Father as long as I recognize Jesus Christ died for my sins. He is my Lord and my Savior. It is in trusting in Yeshua that is the only way that I can be reconciled to God. It is not about doing His commandments. That is not a salvation issue. Doing the commands of God is not a salvation issue. It's not. But it is a way that I reveal my love to Him. We need the revelation of Romans 8.18. 8, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will give us later. This is but just a fraction of a time when we're talking eternity. It really is. It's a fraction of the time. Our purpose on this earth, I've heard it taught a billion times, our purpose on this earth is to learn how to love God and love others. That's, that's absolutely true. To learn, to, we need to learn to love God and love others. But I think obedience is required as well. Okay? I can't tell you how many times the Lord told me to give the dude 20 bucks standing on the side of the road and I drove by because I didn't feel like he... I feel like he really wasn't poor. He was just pretending. Ten years ago, there was a homeless dude once in a while. Now there's one on every single on and off ramp. 20 of them. And I'm like, mm, I don't know, them shoes look pretty new. I'm not giving you that $20. I mean, I'm just being real. You know what I'm saying? And then I look at that dude, and I'm like, yeah, he's looking pretty shabby. I'll give him $30. But I was disobedient no matter how we slice it. The Lord told me to give him $20, and it's up to him to deal with whatever he wants to do with it. My job is just to obey. That's in the practical sense of Jesus. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if I put that same thing in the Old Testament as one of the Ten Commandments, it might be putting us under the law. Wait a minute, that don't sound right. 
The Old Testament holds up the New Testament. Never ever is there a differentiate of one is better than the other. I'm so grateful that this, this Rod has brought it up several times. This passage has been brought up several times, and we need to get this one too. Revelations 14, 12. Revelations 14, 12. Let this encourage God's holy people to endure persecution patiently and to remain firm to the end, obeying his commands and trusting Jesus. Revelation is compounding, ladies and gentlemen. Revelation is compounding. We are getting new revelations as the time gets shorter. We're getting new revelations of God as as Jesus is getting ready to come onto this earth. As he gets closer, his radiant brilliance, his awesomeness is coming. And so his ways are being revealed. We have to try to look at some stuff with an objective point of view. Lord, is this, is this possible? Lord, you know, is this really possible? I've been studying this stuff for a year now, and I'm telling you what, when I first started to realize it, I was sharing with Brandon Carter, David Yoder, and Susie. It shipwrecked my faith. Everything I thought I knew about Christianity rocked me. Like, you know what I'm saying? Well, Jesus came and he died for my sins and, and he fulfilled the law, so I can just throw it in the trash. And then somebody challenged me. They said, are your wedding vows fulfilled to your wife? And I said, yeah. And they said, so do you quit fulfilling them? And I said, no. You understand? Jesus came and he lived out what we're supposed to live out. He fulfilled it. He was so full of it. I've studied that word inside out, upside down, the actual original Hebrew playru. And what it is, it's to be so full, so full of something that if you touch it, it overflows. If a waiter came to me and I said, fill up my glass of water, and she filled it up and I said, it's filled, get it out of here. I don't want it no more. She would look at me like I was crazy. We have to reevaluate some of the things that we've been taught Take him before the Father and ask him what he wants to show me. Lord, what do you want to show me here? We cannot be so familiar with a God we hardly know. We can't. We cannot. It says we can't even fathom. No eye has seen, no ear has heard. We can't even fathom how amazing he is. And I think I understand. Lord, Have mercy. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. I have so much more stuff that I want to share. I'm not going to share. We're just going to hold on right here. We're just going to stop right here. I know that a lot of stuff came out, a lot of stuff for everybody to think about. Don't take my word for it. Take it to the Lord. Everybody, please check. I mean... Look, look, look. I've been coming to this church for 12 years. Okay, You guys have watched me go up. You've watched me go down. You've watched me sin. You've watched me repent. You've watched me grow. You've watched me fail. Please hear my heart. It is not my heart to put anybody in bondage. It is not my heart to put anybody under the law. Okay? It isn't. You guys know me. Do you not know me? The 12 years of living life with you not develop anything, any kind of trust at all, that you would think that I'm seriously trying to put people in bondage. <laughs> we were, I was heads of the deliverance ministry here. That's what we did is broke people out of bondage. I'm saying fresh revelation is coming. As the light is getting closer to the world, the darkness is fleeing, and his ways are being revealed. And if we are not willing to lay, lay some of our thought processes, at least just lay them on the altar and say, Lord, if it's not of you, burn it up. Are we willing to be tried by fire? I, I, 
I say that I am. You guys don't even, you don't even know the struggle that I have. You don't even know the struggle. You don't even know. My, my wife can, t- it is so hard. Listen, what God gave Jesus, what God gave Peter, James, John, Paul, the whole world thought they were coon, just crazy. Like, you guys are nuts. It's no different. The Lord says, you want to obey me passionately? Share this. And I'm like, they'll hate me. They won't understand. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I wasn't going to do this, but now I'm going to do this. <laughs> I was going to, I just, I just want you guys, I just want to try to put some stuff really into perspective, okay? How the apostles died. How the apostles died. You know the apostles? How they all died. Matthew, you know, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew suffered martyrdom in Ethiopia. He was killed by a sword wound. Okay? Mark died in Alexandria of Egypt after being dragged by horses through the streets until he was dead. Luke was hanged in Greece as a result of tremendous preaching to the lost. So for him being faithful and obedient and revealing the Father's love to humanity, he was hanged. John faced martyrdom when he was boiled in a huge basin of boiling oil. Doesn't that sound fun? (laughs) However, he was delivered from that. He lived through that. John was sentenced to the mines on the prison island of Patmos where he wrote the prophetic book of Revelation. The apostle John was later freed and returned to serve as bishop. After all of that persecution, he stayed faithful to God and and kept serving. I don't know if I got that in me. If I got boiled, I I might chicken out, if I'm being honest. John was the only one that died, an old man. The only one that died peacefully. Peter was crucified upside down. You know, you guys know, according to church tradition, he was crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to die the way that his Savior died. James, the leader of the church in Jerusalem, Jesus' brother, he was thrown over 100 feet. He was thrown from the southeast pinnacle of the temple. He was tossed off the temple where they go to worship God. Am I going to be willing to stand here and, and preach and somebody tossed me off to die? I mean, these guys are dedicated. 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 You know what's crazy is he survived the fall. He survived the fall and his enemies caught him and beat him to death. James, the son of Zebedee, was a fisherman by trade. You know, he was a leader of the church. He was beheaded in Jerusalem. Later, James was beheaded The Roman officer who guarded James watched and he was amazed as James defended his faith. The officer walked beside James' place of execution, overcome with conviction, and he declared his new faith in Jesus, knelt behind him and accepted the same beheading as a Christian. Are we willing to die for the cause for somebody else's soul? It is getting serious, guys. It is getting serious. We may not see... Listen... There was a guy who just got put in prison in Canada because he's holding services. Canada is right across the border. It is at our doorstep. We have got to think about some things. Bartholomew, he's known as Nathaniel. He was a missionary in Asia, Asia, witness to the Lord, which is, and today it's Turkey. He was martyred for his preaching in Armenia where he was flayed to death with a whip, beat to death with a whip. Andrew, saying he was crucified upside down on a cross. Thomas was stabbed with a spear in India during one of his missionary trips. But he established the church on that subcontinent. (laughs) Jude was killed with arrows when he refused to deny his faith in Christ. Matthias, The apostle chosen to replace Judas the traitor, he was stoned to death and then beheaded as if you're not dead enough. Paul was tortured and then beheaded by the emperor Nero. I'm not trying to be scary. I'm not trying to be gory. 
But Jesus said in Matthew 10, we will be hated by all men for his name's sake. And he that endures till the end will be saved. Whoo! Heavy words. Do you want to deliver this stuff? Because I don't. You all are my brothers and sisters. I want nothing more to come in and encourage you. The Lord's like, say this. And I'm like, I quit. And he was like, do you love me? And I said, I do love you. And he said, then do what I asked you to do. And I'm like, but they'll hate me. Do you love me? I do love you. Passionate obedience. Passionate obedience. Do you love God enough to do what he asks you to do? It might be giving the homeless guy $20. It might be honoring one of his commandments. Do you have what it takes to be passionately obedient to the one that loved you, the one that loved you so much that he laid his life down? He laid his life down for us so that we could lay our life down for him. He says, those that cling to his life will lose it, but those who lose our lives for his name's sake will find it. Please, please, please open your Bibles and read them. I wish that we had great days ahead of us. But when I read the Bible, that ain't what I see. If you guys got a different version, I'm all for it. But these things must happen in order for our Messiah to come back. Ask the Holy Spirit, please. I'm, 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 I, beg, I beg you, I am begging you, please. Ask the Holy Spirit about this stuff. Um, we're just, I know that this one was heavy, so let's, uh, let's just bow our heads for just a moment, please. Um, if anybody in here does not know Jesus, you've heard some of this and it could sound scary, but he loves you. God loves you so much. He loves you so much that he sent his son to die for your behalf so that you do not have to be held accountable for, for, for sin. I would urge you that if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please. He brought you here in this day for this time because he wants to meet you right here and right now. If that's you, just ask him. Ask the Lord. Ask him into your heart. Say, Lord, will you come into my heart? Will you save my soul? Will you forgive me for my sins? Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Ask him to renew you to right standing with God the Father. Ask him to restore you. And for those of you that, that do know the Lord, I pray that the Lord would open your hearts, open your minds, Open your spiritual eyes and your spiritual ears. Lord, I ask that you would magnify your words. Lord, I ask that you would place this unquenchable desire within us to do your will, to know the Father, to know the Father, to know his ways. Lord, I ask that you would help us to love unconditionally. I ask that you would help us to love our brothers and sisters. I ask that you would do the hard things. You would ask, you would, you would, Give us strength to do the hard things like pray for our enemies. Lord, we love you. I ask that you would bring us back to a place of passionate obedience. Rekindle that fire that once burned so great within each and every one of us. Lord, help us to advance your kingdom. Help us to be your hands and feet. Lord, help us to love them because you love them. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.